It is 5.30 right now, and many of us can physically feel the clock ticking ever closer to 8.45 a.m. September 11th. That was the moment 20 years ago our lives would change forever. Saturday marks the 20th anniversary of a tragedy now referred to as only a date, 9-11. David Winter is live in our studio with a story you only see here on Local 12. A Northern Kentucky family that has that date seared painfully into their memories. David? Yeah, it sure is, Megan. For those of us who are old enough to remember, we all suffered a loss that day, a loss of trust, a loss of innocence. But for some, that loss cuts much deeper. Brian, um, one of a kind, smart, athletic, smile for everyone, friend to everyone. Peggy Fritz remembering her nephew and godson, Brian Williams. Brian played basketball as well. He's right there. Brian's good friend, Jack Lenahan, taking us through Covington Catholic's 1990 yearbook when Brian was a standout basketball player, track and field star, football player, and all around good person. He was just a great guy, a great friend. Uh, when you were with him, you always were having fun. Both Jack and Brian graduated and went off to college. Brian would go to Columbia and get a job as a bond trader at Cantor Fitzgerald. His office was near the top of the World Trade Center. 8.45 a.m., September 11, 2001. Peggy was dropping off her son at Cove Cath, and she heard on the radio about the first jet hitting the North Tower. She saw the assistant principal standing outside. I just said, did you hear a plane hit the World Trade Center? And he looked at me. I said, that's where Brian is. At about the same time, Jack was learning of the terror attack as well. What was your first thought? That Brian was in there because we knew he worked there. Both Peggy and Jack would end up at the Williams home glued to the television. Every time the phone would ring, you would think, OK, that's Brian telling us I got out. I'm OK. But that call never came. And then the collapse of Tower One. Silence in just stared at that TV going, you know, we can't believe this happened. Me. Covington Catholic put together a video for the one year anniversary of the tragedy. In it, Brian speaking from the grave. I haven't decided where I'm going to school. I'd, I'd like to go to an Ivy League school and possibly play football. But I'm undecided right now. Brian followed those dreams, but never got a chance to live out the big picture, moving back to Kentucky to get married and have kids. He would be right there, for sure. Uh, no doubt about it. It's still hard for you. It is. It is. Tough to think about. It is. Just brings it all back that day. 20 years later, Brian's friends and family can find some consolation in knowing he is still with them. I just think he would smiles down on us every day and watches over us and He's there. Remember me. Brian was 29 when he died. Adding to the tragedy, his older brother Kenny died just 10 years before, having fallen from a pedestrian bridge on his way home from a Reds game. But through all of their grief, friends and family created the Kenny and Brian Williams Fund that provides scholarships every year to Covington Catholic students to help them realize their dreams, dreams that these two young men never had a chance to completely fulfill. Megan? Oh, so heartbreaking. David, thank you for sharing their story. And if you want to find the link to the Kenny and Brian Williams Facebook page, we have it on local12.com. Covington Catholic will commemorate Brian and his brother at its football game tomorrow night. Tonight, in the local fight against COVID, the Kentucky National Guard is being deployed to help overworked hospital workers in northern Kentucky. Governor Andy Bashir announced today they'll start arriving at St. Elizabeth and Covington next week. James Pilcher is in our studio with a look at why the Guard is needed. James? Thanks, Megan. First, a grim statistic. With our number of deaths in COVID in the northern Kentucky area this week, we've now seen more than 500 30 COVID caused fatalities. That's an average about a one a day since the pandemic started. But the big concern right now is what the current surge is doing to the area's healthcare system, especially at Northern Kentucky's largest hospital system, St. Elizabeth's. St. Elizabeth Healthcare's awesome. Dr. James Horn says the system is treating about 150 COVID patients and that St. Elizabeth's is at about 90% capacity overall. Some is a rush of patients but some is created by staffing shortages. Many left the profession due to the stress caused by the pandemic. 
for all of our staff, I think overwhelmingly the word at this point is tired. People are very tired at this point. And I think there's a degree of frustration at this point because we know what works. We know what can help keep us out of this. Here's how the numbers have skyrocketed in the Fort County region, including Boone, Campbell, Kenton, and Grant. In late June, numbers plummeted to single digits daily with only 84 total cases reported. But watch what's happened in the last month. Total cases were at about 1,400 in mid-August, but the last week of August saw almost 2,000 total cases. And the region has almost 1,200 new active cases just this week, with not all numbers yet reported. Governor Andy Bashir said Thursday there are only 90 intensive care beds available statewide and that other hospitals are bursting at the seams due to the surge caused by the Delta variant. Folks, our hospital situation has never been more dire in my lifetime than it is right now. Well, the entire state's on fire. Northern Kentucky Health Department Interim Director Steve Devine says even the most recent surge has only led to an increase of about 2% in the region's vaccination rates month over month. Now it's down to the folks who definitely don't want to get it uh, or have gotten some, some bad information that uh, to make them uh, think that it's not a good idea. Now, just a, just a couple of minutes ago, Andy Bashir released the state's numbers just for today. 52, 52 new cases, 36 new deaths and positivity rates of 14% or more for the state. Remember, this is all happening as the General Assembly meets in Frankfurt in a special session Bashir called this week. He's asking for the state of emergency to be extended and more mask and vaccine mandates be put in place. But the Republican controlled legislature appears unwilling to go along with the Democratic governor. Back to you guys. All right, we'll keep our eye on it. Thank you, James. Overall, the National Guard is deploying 310 members to 21 hospitals across the Bluegrass State. This is going to have a huge impact on workers uh, really all around the country. There's already been pushback. Courtney Wheaton joins us now, and I know you've been speaking to a local attorney about how this is going to move forward and how it's going to affect everybody. Paula, I did, and she gave a really interesting perspective. This is many local companies say they haven't even had enough time to really navigate these new rules. Now, there are plenty of workers taking to social media to share their disapproval. Tonight, I spoke to an attorney who tried to answer some of the most asked questions. The president dropping a bombshell. I'm announcing that the Department of Labor is developing an emergency rule to require all employers with 100 or more employees to ensure their workforces are fully vaccinated. Labor lawyer Katie Trantner says the Biden administration can expect lawsuits. And I think the federal government um, believes that they're on solid ground here. Um, and I'm sure that there will be litigation, um, but I'm not sure that um, any challenges to this will be successful. And she predicts many local businesses may get some relief from the president's announcement. This mandate um, will help employers who maybe wanted to implement a vaccine mandate, but were worried about um, losing workers in a tight job market already. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration will create the emergency rule for businesses with more than 100 employees. There could be pretty hefty fines for employers who don't comply. Um, so my guess is that, you know, this is going to be something that's going to move forward. And of course, there will be legal challenges. Um, but my advice to my clients would be to begin preparing to implement something like this. But there could be some exceptions to the rule. Um, right now, under federal law, there's exemptions for a sincerely held religious belief um, for medical or disability reasons. And I would expect that those exemptions um, would continue. And she thinks there could be an upside beyond curbing the pandemic. Bringing those workers back downtown, I think, will have a huge impact. These kinds of mandates will give people um, the impetus they need to get, get back out there. And we just received a statement from the Ohio Business Roundtable. It says in part, their members believe the vaccine is safe and effective, but also believe every employer should have the autonomy to decide what is best for the health and safety of their customers and employees. Now it goes on to say the mandate will put businesses at an even greater disadvantage to fill the tremendous workforce gap that already exists. We put that entire statement online at local12.com. Paula, back to All you. All right, thanks, Courtney. We